I want to welcome you to the 14th annual Philip Gamble Lecture, sponsored by the Department of uh, Economics here at the University. The Gamble Lecture was established in memory of Philip Gamble, a professor of economics here from 1935 until 1971. It was established by Gamble's widow, Elizabeth Gamble Breed, and by Israel Ragosa, a student of Professor Gamble's. So this afternoon, I'm thrilled to have Gretchen Morgensen here as our Gamble Lecture. The title of her lecture is After the Deluge, a look at Washington, Wall Street, and Main Street post-meltdown. In short, because of Gretchen Morganson, a very opaque, dark, and I would say sometimes sinister corner of our economy has become much more transparent. And I think we all owe her a great debt for that. So as you can see, I'm just tickled pink to have Gretchen Morganson with us today. You know, it's interesting to uh, be looking back on the events of 2008 from two years uh, and still be trying to fathom what went on and what hit us and who the perpetrators are. But I think we are still very much in the midst of learning about this crisis, how it came about, how it was perpetrated, and how we can perhaps prevent it from ever happening again. Um, I sometimes feel not that I am writing journalism, but that I am an archaeologist who picks up little tiny pieces of you know, dust-encrusted information, brushes it off, and then tries to fit it into the puzzle of whatever it is that we're trying to explain. And in this case, it was a very complex sequence of events that really um, almost blew up the economy. So looking back to those dire events of 2008, the fall of 2008, it just almost seems impossible to believe that two years have gone by. I will never forget the Lehman weekend, um, one of the oldest names on Wall Street going bankrupt. It was unthinkable. The Tuesday night that followed when AIG, the world's largest insurance company, was rescued by the government. The weekend that the Treasury decided to take over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, two of the largest financial institutions on the planet that were about to implode. It was a stunning and really bewildering time for everyone. But for those of us in the business press who were trying to make sense of what was happening, I felt like it was really surreal. I remember sitting at my desk watching the stock market plunge on my Bloomberg machine, all the while knowing that in markets that were more opaque, less visible, there were even worse, more harrowing things going on. These would be the credit default swap markets, the mortgage markets. I am so glad that that terrifying period is behind us. Or is it? Two years after the deluge, after the events that we broadly call the panic of 2008 or the credit crisis, most of the nation remains very much in its throes. Not everyone, mind you. Inhabitants of some quarters, such as Wall Street and the banks, are thriving. And the stock market, which stands around 11,000, if you're looking at the Dow Jones, represents a rare bright spot on our financial horizon. Corporate earnings, too, are expected to increase 45% in 2010 over last year. But the fact that the debacle and the aftermath continue to affect so many people is undeniable. Unemployment remains stubbornly high. Consumer debt levels are still in the stratosphere. Household wealth, meanwhile, has plummeted, largely as a result of crumbling home prices. Consumer confidence is low, and consumer spending, which accounts for two-thirds of gross domestic product, is moribund. While the government tells us that the Great Recession ended in June 2009, for many people, this statistic is at odds with what they see and feel every day. 
The fact is, a prolonged period of economic pain is a new and disturbing experience for many Americans who have grown accustomed in recent years to financial crises that pass relatively quickly. Think about it. Over the past 25 years, Americans have learned that the typical financial storm blows in and then out fairly fast, leaving behind some, but not massive, amounts of damage. Since the mid-1980s, that's been our experience. The stock market crash of 1987, for example, when the major stock indices lost one-fifth of their value in one day. That was a certifiably awful event. But share prices recovered a lot of their losses within days, and by the time two years had passed, where we are today, stocks were back at pre-crash levels. The savings and loan failures of the late 1980s were another example of a relatively contained crisis. While it is true that a 1,000 banks collapsed during this period, and that these troubles contributed to a nationwide recession a few years later, the mess subsided without disastrous consequences. Ditto for the 1998 collapse of long-term capital management, the giant hedge fund, and the bursting of the internet stock bubble in 2000. Investors absorbed big losses, but they were by no means crippling. Now, no one welcomed these incidents or enjoyed them as they were occurring. But because their effects were relatively muted, these financial disturbances left many Americans singularly unprepared for the deep and lasting turmoil we are currently in. Even if you accept the recent report from the National Bureau of Economic Research that the recession ended last in June of 2009, that would make the duration of this downturn 18 months, the second longest after the Great Depression. Previous contractions in the post-World War II era lasted an average of 10 months, the Great Depression 43 months. But 24 months after the disastrous autumn of 08, why aren't we experiencing a stronger economy? I think it's because we are in the midst of a protracted, enormous, and excruciating deleveraging process. We are purging the debt that we amassed during the credit binge of the early 2000s, and that process will take much longer than many may have thought because the size of the asset bubble and the debt that funded it was so unbelievably huge. Because ours was a crisis built on debt, and massive amounts of it, its after effects will be felt for a long time. Debt is a wonderful thing when prices are rising, because it can amplify an investor's gains. But when losses result, debt works to magnify them. That's because while asset prices fall, the amount of debt used to buy these assets stays at the same level until it is paid down or written off. This is one of the hardest lessons an investor has to learn. The assets might shrink, but the debt doesn't. And so you have legions of homeowners across the country carrying mortgages that exceed the value of the property underlying them by a considerable amount. According to CoreLogic, a research firm, 23% of borrowers nationwide are underwater on their mortgages. Massachusetts has almost 19% of borrowers upside down on their mortgages. But in the state of Nevada, 71% of mortgages have a value greater than the properties that underlie them. Half of the borrowers in Florida are in this position. The assets shrink, but the debt doesn't. At the end of the first quarter, American households owed a total of $13.5 trillion to their lenders, representing 120% of their after-tax incomes. At the peak of the bubble in the second half of 2007, household debt stood at 130% of disposable income, more than twice the level seen one generation earlier. 
and that, at the time, was a record. Most of this $13.5 trillion is mortgage debt, which stands at $10 trillion. Now, to get it back to a more manageable level, economists at Goldman Sachs believe that figure will have to decline by at least $3 trillion. Much of the decline, as much as $2 trillion, will consist of subprime loans, which probably should not have been made in the first place. One reason why this deleveraging will take so much longer than usual is that the leveraging went so much further than it ever had before. <coughs> Throughout the late 90s and into the 2000s, personal incomes were stagnant but costs of health care, college education, and real estate were rising. So consumers withdrew money from their homes to cover the difference between income and outflow. They did this through home equity loans and second liens offered by easy money lenders. The amounts of this indebtedness taken on as property prices were soaring was just plain staggering. In 2005 alone, homeowners extracted three quarters of a trillion dollars from their homes, spending two-thirds of it on personal consumption, home improvements, and paying down credit card debt. During the three years of 05, 06, and 07, borrowers were extracting between 600 billion and 800 billion a year from their homes. While the real estate bubble was expanding, these debts were secured by properties whose prices were rocketing. Now, these borrowings are unsecured because the real estate assets beneath them have plunged in value. While mortgages are by far the largest debt held by consumers, our credit card obligations, car loans, and the like are also considerable. Today, these debts stand at $2.4 trillion, to return to a sustainable level, they would have to decline by as much as 20%. Overall, for debt levels to become more manageable, economists say that debt should be about 80% of disposable income, down from 120% now. For almost four decades, beginning in the early 1960s and extending through the mid-90s, the debt to disposable income level had remained in a range of between 58% on the low side and 85% on the high side. So you can see how wild and woolly this debt accumulation got in recent years. And you can also see why consumer spending is now in the doldrums. Many people are wisely using any extra money they generate now to pay down their borrowings, to cut up their high-cost credit cards and kick the debt habit. The number of open credit card accounts was down 23% recently from the highs reached during the second quarter of 2008, according to the Federal Reserve. Still, this deleveraging process cannot happen overnight. And economists say that if the recent pare down of debt continues, and if household incomes grow modestly, it might be eight years before we return to equilibrium. A McKinsey Global Institute study of past deleveraging episodes showed that the typical downshift during the aftermath lasts six to seven years. We've lived through two painful years already. If these estimates are correct, we've got about five or six years to go. In the meantime, Americans are in a world of hurt. Halfway through the year, 11.4% of outstanding consumer debt was delinquent, totaling $1.3 trillion. Almost $1 trillion of that is seriously delinquent meaning at least 90 days late. A half a million people had a foreclosure added to their credit reports between March 31 and June 30, an increase of 8.7% over the first quarter of the year. And the numbers of consumers with new bankruptcies appearing on their credit reports rose 34% during the quarter to 621,000. That increase is significantly larger than it has been 
in the last few years, according to the Fed. The recent census figures also indicate the misery out there. In 2009, there were 44 million Americans living in poverty, more than have ever been recorded in the 51 years these statistics have been collected. Our nation's poverty rate stands at 14.3% of the population. Saddest of all, children are the fastest growing impoverished group, increasing 8.7% last year over 2008. Putting some of this in perspective, poverty has increased faster during this recession than it did during the brutal economic downturn of 1973. The census also shows that workers' wages have stagnated or fallen over the past decade. Median household income was $49,777 in 2009, roughly static from a year earlier, but down 5% from the peak in household income in 1999. Incomes aren't the only things that are falling. The Federal Reserve Board recently reported that the wealth of U.S. households declined by 2.8% in the second quarter of 2010. Household net worth, which consists of stocks, bonds, real estate, and other assets, minus mortgages and other debts, stood at $53.5 trillion. Is it any wonder that consumers are worried? Confidence among consumers, which drives 70% of our nation's GDP, fell unexpectedly in September to 48.5 from 53.2 in August. This is all pretty downbeat stuff, I acknowledge. But I also know that Americans are an ingenious, indomitable, and hardworking people. And we have what it takes to climb out of this massive hole that we've dug ourselves into. It's just that it's going to be a long and difficult slog. Our days of instant gratification are over. This is not a bad thing, in my view. The concept of shopping till you drop using borrowed money was never a sustainable one. Loading oneself with debt is a type of enslavement, after all, and Understanding the implications of this is crucial for a healthy society. I, for one, am hopeful that a lesson learned in this crisis is that less can be more for many consumers. But while consumers may be learning hard lessons in this crisis, many in positions of power on Wall Street and Washington are not. While Main Street suffers, Wall Street and Washington thrive. This disparity, a scenario where pain is not shared by all of those involved in a problem, is deeply disturbing to many in America. I know because I receive searing, angry, or just plain bewildered email messages from readers across the country. Why, they ask, are banks being allowed to force troubled borrowers from their homes without proving that they have the right to do so under the law? Why are the regulators in Washington the same folks who failed so utterly in their duties to rein in the reckless lending that almost blew up the economy? Why are they now being rewarded with even more responsibility? Why are some of the very people who were on the scene of this particular crime in positions of even greater power now? Others wonder why no government agency or law enforcement group has tried to recover some of the many millions of dollars in compensation given to the heads of companies that later failed or required bailout money. And the most common question of all, why has no one involved in this crisis gone to jail? Now you have a little taste of what fills up my email box daily. And even more distressing than these questions is the fact that I have no satisfactory answers to them. Yes, the mess of 2008 is over. And yes, the Great Recession may have ended too. But we are still in a very perilous place, even as the crisis recedes. And that is because people understand more clearly than ever that there are two sets of rules in America. 
One set, which the citizenry receives, can be described as tough love. If you borrowed to buy a home that went down in value and that you can no longer afford, perhaps because you've lost your job, that's your problem. Get over it. But for the institutions that created our woes, there's a kinder and more forgiving set of rules. If they took on too much risk during the mortgage mania, they get a taxpayer bailout. Their problems are everyone's problems. Let's throw money at them to avoid systemic risk. I'd like to read you an email I recently received in response to a column I wrote about how the recent Dodd-Frank law actually increases the potential for government backstops of big institutions in the future. Quote, Ms. Morganson, don't you think it interesting that the self-proclaimed geniuses of Wall Street need a backstop? because their hedges don't work? Don't you think it interesting that they use the government to make us provide that backstop? Isn't it interesting that they say we, the people, don't need the backstop of Medicare or that evil, evil Social Security? End quote. What this reader is getting at is the heart of the problem our country faces today the dueling rules I mentioned a minute ago that have created a mass sense of mistrust in government and in business leaders. Americans are rightfully outraged that those who created the crisis, both on Wall Street and in Washington, continue to get taxpayer help or take no responsibility for the mess. Shame and a sense of shared sacrifice seem simply to have gone missing among many of America's leaders. Even as the government has thrown trillions of dollars into the system to mitigate the impact of the downturn, millions of people have been forced from their homes and trust in the nation's regulators and in some of our largest and most venerable institutions have been shattered. The problem of distrust, I think, is a huge one. And it can be seen in recent poll numbers published by the Associated Press and CNBC. After polling 1,035 investors, the analysis showed a majority, 55%, said they believe the market and Wall Street is not a level playing field. The perception that the market is fair to only some investors is pervasive. Nearly 90% of small investors those with portfolios below $50,000, said the market is biased against them. And more than 75% of investors worth at least $250,000 said Wall Street is unfair to the little guy. This is deeply troubling because small investors have been big participants in the market over the past generation. And losing that participation will have consequences. Not only will it be harder for companies to raise capital and create jobs, a prevailing view of unfairness also means investors will have fewer choices when they deploy their investment dollars and plan for retirement. As for restoring faith in government, well, this is job one, according to the poll. It found mass mistrust in regulators' ability to police the financial system. Only 8% of those interviewed said they had strong confidence, in, strong confidence in financial regulators. Half of those polled expressed little or no confidence, including 16% of the latter, zero confidence. This is no surprise given that almost every one of the nation's financial regulators fell asleep on the job in the years leading up to the disaster. This included the folks at the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Office of Thrift Supervision, the Comptroller of the Currency, Housing and Urban Development, and the Fed. About the only group that does not appear to have been snoozing throughout was the FDIC. Now that the taxpayers are on the hook for hundreds of billions of dollars in bailouts, I think it's high time to examine what is considered business as usual at the highest reaches of some American companies. 
From my perch at the New York Times, I see a disturbing sense of entitlement among some business leaders today that lets them justify siphoning off massive wealth from their shareholders even when their performance is mediocre or downright disastrous. And the way some of these companies treat their customers and their workers is equally troubling. There are some who say that this crisis proves that capitalism doesn't work. I'm not sure that this is right. Capitalism still may work, but it has to be protected from the sorts of capitalists who will take everything for themselves, leaving nothing for the rest of us. These are the people who reap all of the gains when they are taking on massive risks, but then force the taxpayer to shoulder the losses when they inevitably arise. The men at the top of Citigroup, Merrill Lynch, Washington Mutual, Bear Stearns. This is not the way capitalism is supposed to work. Privatizing gains and socializing losses is deeply unfair, thoroughly un-American, I thought. But that is precisely what has characterized the aftermath of the credit craze. I am a believer in the free markets, but I also believe that it, because I believe that it is crucial for entrepreneurs to be able to raise capital and create jobs, and allow investors, too, to share in the wealth that's created under a capitalist system. There's no country on earth that does this better than America. But it is because of these beliefs that I have grown so distressed in recent years as people in high places have abused the system. It's an unfortunate truth that a few bad apples can spoil the entire barrel. Populist capitalism, like ours, can be hugely beneficial to a vast majority of people. But an ethical tradition is needed to make it all work. When you have senior executives walking away with hundreds of millions of dollars, leaving shareholders and innocent taxpayers in the dirt, it becomes extremely dangerous. And as more and more jobs disappear from this country, the outsized pay amassed by corporate executives becomes even more polarizing. Here's an annoying fact. Did you know that the American taxpayer is still footing the legal bills amassed by the former top executives of Fannie Mae, the mortgage finance giant? They are defending themselves against shareholder lawsuits pertaining to their phony accounting that arose in 2005. Now, these bills are small in the grand scheme of things, I admit, maybe millions of dollars, certainly not billions. But the mere fact that they are our responsibility is beyond exasperating. The trouble today is that some in corporate America, together with their co-conspirators on Wall Street, have rigged the game so that executives can get immensely risk, rich at the expense of their shareholders, and often to the detriment of their workers. Think for a moment about the hundreds of billions in losses taken by some of our largest and formerly respected financial institutions. Some of the executives who ran these companies into the ground, none of these executives, sorry, who ran these companies into the ground, have been forced to give back compensation that they earned when the losing positions were put on the books. Yes, some of them lost money when their stock prices collapsed as their companies cratered, but so many executives had earned so much over the prior years that such losses are only a fraction of their total compensation. As these people skate away from the scene, they send the rest of us a clear message. It's a dangerous one. Accountability is AWOL if you reach the highest levels of corporate America. You can collect all the gains when the party is on, but when the hangover comes, the losses are somebody else's responsibility, either your shareholders or the taxpayers, or both. It is dispiriting that leaders would behave this way. After all, leaders are supposed to be exemplars, people we can look up to. 
And yet what many have done is simply run away, disclaiming responsibility, conduct unbecoming a leader of any kind. These practices also have consequences, and I think we see them most clearly in the anger that is evident among Americans today. Trust is hard won but easily lost, and a great deal of it has been squandered in the recent failures and bailouts. I'm not only talking about trust in private institutions like banks and other corporations, but also about our government. The credit crisis was a two-pronged failure after all. First was the failure by the private sector to rein itself in or limit itself to appropriate business practices. The profits from reckless activities were simply too tantalizing to pass up for many of the executives running these institutions. The take the money and run mentality ran amok. Second, however, was the abysmal regulatory performance. While Citigroup, for example, was amassing its mountain of toxic assets, regulators at the New York Fed, overseen by Timothy Geithner, were loosening the reins on the company. And the failure by people at the highest levels of our regulatory system to understand the risky practices being pursued by some of the nation's largest banks was nothing short of breathtaking. This inability to recognize peril when it was staring them in the face meant that Ben Bernanke and his colleagues were far behind when the subprime crisis began to metastasize. According to Mr. Bernanke's calendars and schedules, which we FOIA'd at the New York Times, it was not until August 14, 2007, that the chairman of the Federal Reserve gathered his staff for a meeting to discuss subprime mortgages. Former Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson's schedules indicate that the first discussion of the subprime problem in his office occurred on September 6, 2007. If these were indeed the first in-depth discussions about subprime, then the heads of both the Fed and the Treasury were playing a serious game of catch-up when problems in this arena erupted several months later. The question that I believe remains to be answered, and that it will have to be tackled by ethicists and others far better qualified than I, is why was greed allowed to go so viral during this period? I think part of an explanation lies in a rejection by some business leaders of a powerful social compact, a duty to others rather than just to self, that had been embraced by many people in positions of power. Recognizing that they had immense sway over investors, workers, and customers, these people agreed to hold themselves to a higher standard of care. It was an unwritten rule, perhaps, but it did seem to guide many people for quite a long time. Now it seems to have been supplanted by the notion that personal profits are supreme and that making it to the top means having the biggest bank account. I don't know exactly how we recover an attention to duty and care for others in the business world. I don't know how to force people in high places to forego profits for propriety. I know that those of us in the media can do our part by shining light on the dark corners where such behavior often flourishes. But I've also concluded that Americans know how to right themselves when they recognize that they are headed down the wrong path. Such a shift can begin when we hold our leaders accountable and when we as consumers and investors protect ourselves from harm by saying no to dubious practices. By dealing whenever we can with companies that are worthy of our trust, we can help ensure that such enterprises succeed. There are plenty of these kinds of operations, large and small, across America. And given that Washington seems pretty dysfunctional and Wall Street remains a scary place indeed, 
it seems increasingly obvious to me that the folks on Main Street are the only ones who can pull us out of this mess. Faced with so many woeful stories of the people harmed in the Great Recession, I concede that it's hard to be optimistic about our future and what kind of a country we are leaving to our children. But America as the land of opportunity, accountability, and honesty has not vanished altogether. I prefer to think it has been only temporarily subverted. Yes, it has taken some very damaging body blows, but the traits that made this country great, hard work, selflessness, honor, are still very much in us. We have just lived through a period when they weren't rewarded. To regain confidence after enduring this mess, I believe that at least some of the people who blew up these institutions must be held accountable for their actions. Investors, pensioners, employees, and taxpayers all have been hurt by reckless risk-taking at the very highest levels. It will be criminal if the people who created this disaster and profited mightily from it are allowed to slink off into the night. Then we will have confirmed the suspicion that the paths of the powerful are protected, but that the little guy must fend for himself. And that, I hope and I pray, is not the new American way. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'll call on you and then I can repeat the question so everyone can hear. Yes, sir. I've had the opportunity to work at just about every level of government. And what I've noticed over the past 30 years is that the concept of what government is supposed to function as or to be regulation seems to have lost for a whole generation going the concept either of elected officials or the employees for the government, that that part of the function of these years, too, this is not financial. We're just the whole oil in the Gulf where inspectors did the job. And recently, with the story that broke yesterday with the largest Medicare fraud in history, what they covered is the fraud. I think the other half of it is how government, government employees were reviewing fictitious doctors, fictitious exams, fictitious everything, and paid out $40 million, apparently, to doctors for, a, as an example, a ultrasound pregnancy test to a queer doctor, neither of which were no patient, no doctor, no exam. It seems that there's a failure government to concept of even regulation in this period. And who is doing the regulating? Did everyone hear the comment and question? No? Okay, uh, I'm going to try to synthesize it. Um, essentially asking the question of why um, regulation in a wide array of areas has failed. We have seen problems in the financial system, those regulators, uh, the oil um, inspectors in the Gulf, for example, the Medicare fraud that just emerged uh, yesterday. Um, the question essentially is uh, why are these events or crises or scandals continuing to repeat themselves um, over and over again? Um, I guess my answer to that would be twofold. I think there are two different kinds of um, uh, regulatory failure in that list that you went through. Um, the Medicare fraud, I would put in the incompetence category. Uh, I cannot explain how a person could 
you know, send thousands of dollars, millions, whatever the number is, to things that were on their face apparently fraudulent and would have been, you know, easily identified by maybe a six-year-old. That's hard to understand. It's hard to uh, think of that as anything but just sheer incompetence. The other more troubling um, failure, I think, is the uh, tendency for regulators to be captured by the industry that they are charged with overseeing. Uh, I think that we can absolutely say with certainty that the financial regulators were captured in the years leading up to the crisis. Um, the, it's almost as though these people have, because they deal with the banks, they have the mindset of the banks. It's their world view, almost. Um, my colleagues and I at the paper um, FOIA'd Tim Geithner's calendars for a two-year period before he became the Treasury Secretary when he was the president of the New York Fed. And so it was a, you know, pile of documents like this of his calendars every day and who he went to lunch with and who he had meetings with and who he had dinner with. And it was so skewed and so heavily bank oriented and big deal bank oriented and CEO bank oriented. I mean, lunch at the Four Seasons was common. Um, he sat on a board, a charity organization run by Sandy Weil, the head of Citigroup. I mean, this man was not a regulator. This man was a bank CEO wannabe. And that's his mindset. And so why am I surprised that Citigroup was allowed to you know, amass hundreds of billions of dollars of toxic waste on its balance sheet while Timothy Geithner was supposedly overseeing the bank. So capture, regulatory capture, is a huge problem and one that I think we've seen over the years, as you point out. I don't know how you solve it, but I think you certainly don't solve it by giving the people who are captured bigger, more powerful jobs. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned a problem of distrust, um, and that being a problem for the next time going forward. Um, what about you, you see the, 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 the financial crisis that can be sort of uh, conceived of as a problem of too much trust? So, uh, where do you think the sort of correct level of skepticism applies for investors and people, certainly in general? And um, how successful do you think the media can be uh, in, in providing people with the tools to, to have that level of skepticism? Or where do you think this will Okay, so the question is, uh, we seem to have been too trusting in the years leading up to the crisis. Uh, of the powers that be, um, and now we are talking about a lack of trust um, taking over, and sort of how are we to um, be able to, you know, not have this problem in the future? What the media can do to help uh, prevent this kind of swing between, you know, greed and fear is what the, uh, you know, investors will tell you are the, the, uh, you know, polar opposites. Um, I think that. As far as the trust is concerned, I mean, it was investors, you know, have um, a lot of responsibility or should take responsibility for a great deal of the losses that were encouraged. And I mean institutional investors because they did not do their homework. They did not um, really delve into what these securities were, these mortgage securities, these complex um, collateralized debt obligations, which were made up of pools of pools of mortgages, thousands of loans. Nobody really could plumb these things or understand what they were. They were relying on the ratings agencies to do their homework for them. And so, yes, there was an excess of trust in institutions, not just regulators, but Wall Street banks, ratings agencies, all of these sort of cast of characters that were really supporting the view that everything was fine, real estate prices never go down, um, that the valuations were appropriate for these assets. Um, and so it was a group think in a really powerfully bad way. That's hard to overcome. That's human nature.
people love a bull market. People think they're brilliant. They think that they're responsible for making the right calls when the stock market's going up or whatever market it is. I mean, you, I, you couldn't go to a party in New York or anywhere for that matter without hearing about real estate prices and everyone was euphoric with the you know, vast increases that were going on during the early 2000s. Everyone was very happy about that. So it's, it's a group think, it's an inability to question or, an, or a lack of will to question the conventional wisdom that I think is very, very um, problematic. And that leads me into the media answer, because the media, I think, was part of the unindicted co-conspirators in this group, because I think that we could have been a lot more skeptical and questioning and tougher. But, um, uh, you know, my business is in disarray, to say the least, and uh, it's shrinking, and there are far fewer news organizations than there used to be. And so it's a very difficult dynamic for um, people who do want the media to do the job of, of speaking truth to power, because you have far fewer um, people like me out there who are willing to do that. So investors are kind of on their own. People are going to kind of be on their own. And that's, that's I think, deeply unfortunate. Yes, sir. Well, with the uh, stagnation now, decline of the household income, when you look at uh, uh, education and, uh, and health care, and that's been going on for such a long, long time, how can we possibly look that we might get through this in six or eight years, as, you, as you're suggesting, or hopefully that it would be in terms of the power of amazing, but if, if, when there's such disparity between the wealth uh, the lack of, of investment in the common good and the decline of, uh, of the household income. How, how, how do we turn this around then in six or eight years? Question is, um, given the stagnating incomes, given the disparity between the, the gulf, the widening gulf between rich and poor in this country, how are we going to turn this situation around? I don't have the answer, and if I did, I don't think I'd probably be working at the New York Times as a wage slave. Um, I wish I had the answer. I mean, I think this is what thinking, you know, um, articulate, uh, hopeful, optimistic, um, you know, believers want to know the answer to, and I don't know what the answer is, but I do know what it isn't. And it isn't to allow these big institutions to get bigger, to allow them to be even more powerful than they were, because we know how that, we saw that movie, we know how it ends. And if they're getting bigger, and if there are more of them, and they are, they have certainly been taught extremely well in this incident, whatever you want to call it, crisis, that they will be bailed out there is no doubt in any one of them, their minds that they will be bailed out if they're big enough. So we've sent that message. That message has been delivered. So you can't stuff that back into the toothpaste tube. So my wish list for you know, the Dodd-Frank bill would have been, law would have been to cut these institutions down to size, to make them less perilous for the rest of us. If they're too big to fail, they're too big to succeed, perhaps. But nobody wanted to do that. Nobody had the will to do that. They're very powerful, these entities, these institutions. So I'm afraid I'm going to dodge that question like a politician. But I wish I had the answer. I just don't. In the back, in the middle. You. Yep, you. Uh, you said that accountability The question is, um, has greed increased in the last decade? You know, this is one of those questions that I think somebody, if they could really do a persuasive argument or mount a persuasive argument, it would be really a best-selling book because I think this, I get this question all the time. I ask it myself all the time. 
I never know if what I'm perceiving as a, as a quote, increase in greed is just some sort of, you know, um, uh, nostalgic look backward at a time that didn't really ever exist. Uh, human nature is human nature. Greed is a part of human nature. So that suggests to me that it isn't more of a pro it isn't a bigger part of human nature than it was before. But I do believe that we are in a place where it is rewarded in a way that it might not have been rewarded before. Think about it for a minute. You know, in the old days, if you were, I mean, old days, I don't know, 60s, maybe 50s even, if you were uh, accused or if you were caught, you know, doing some crime, you were a corporate guy, I think you might have been thrown out of your country club. I don't think you'd be thrown out of your country club today. It's almost like there's a sense of uh, acceptability about it if you're wealthy enough. And I think that's kind of permeated. So it's not necessarily that the symptom has grown larger, but that the acceptance of it in society among very high-ranking, powerful people has grown. That ex what is acceptable behavior you know, has changed, and it's become more acceptable um, you know, to uh, get paid if you're a CEO at a level that's 500 times the average worker's salary in your company, which is far greater than it is anywhere else in the world, and far greater than it's been in this country. So that would be my answer to that, but I would welcome a sociological uh, examination of this problem and a, um, an absolute answer to it. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, um, he, he cites two data points to illustrate um, fraud and the pervasiveness of fraud in, in the real estate market. One was that appraisers, 87 in a survey, 97% um, were said to have been asked to inflate a property, uh, property's price. And you asked the question of how WAMU could have been so profligate with its lending even after the market peaked in 2000, the real estate market peaked in 2007. Well, you know, I mean, I think that people get used to a certain, you know, standard of living or pay or level um, of, you know, profitability, whatever your measurement is, and when it's threatened, they start to panic and run faster to try to keep the game going. I mean, I think. Chuck Prince was the one who made the infamous comment about um, as long as they're playing the music, I'm dancing and we're still dancing. And this was Citigroup, you know, where who just, you know, should have been a wallflower at that particular dance instead. <laughs> instead, the taxpayer now, you know, uh, bailed them out. So, you know, I think there's this mentality that no, it's really not a problem. It's really not a problem. Let's just that we double our efforts and we'll still be as profitable, and I'll still make my big paycheck, and we'll still be the most, you know, whatever, third-ranked bank in America, whatever the number is. Um, as far as the appraisers are concerned, I mean, this was something that I think was utterly predictable because, <clears throat> and it was another regulatory failure, um, which was that HUD changed its rules in, I believe, 1996 to allow appraisers to be hired by the bank 
that was going to be financing the property. So that just opened it up for what you can perceive it to be, which is a reason to do inflated appraisals. Um, the mortgage broker, they were all sort of in it together. Instead of having an independent third party who would say, hold on, wait a minute, this house isn't worth $350,000. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you spoke about the creation of this of the moral ha uh, moral hazard for these firms that were deemed too big to fail. Um, how big a role do you think the Federal Reserve played in number one keeping the federal funds rate so for so long, and number two, you know, taking on these bad assets from from these companies? And what do you think the role is for them? Uh, the question was on uh, the question of moral hazard, i.e. bailing out institutions that are too big to fail and the message that that sends, which is that you should fail again because you will be bailed out. So go ahead and be as reckless as you want. Um, the taxpayer come to your rescue. And how big a role did the Fed play in moral hazard in this um, go around? Well, very big, huge. Big as all outdoors. Um, I think the Fed was, you know, in so many ways, a party to creating these institutions and their power. Um, you know, the Fed was extremely involved in loosening capital requirements of banks, for instance. Um, the Basel Accord, the Fed was extremely involved in making sure that banks did not have to set aside increased amounts of capital. They were basically watering down what they had to set aside as a cushion. Um, that was a bank-centric decision on the part of the Fed. Um, you know, I would say my feeling would be that it was more about what the Fed did in the years leading up to the crisis than what they did after the crisis occurred because then you have, you're in a, a a, a financial storm, you're in a tsunami, somebody has to do something, and you know, the one thing you don't want to do is restrict money. You have to throw money at the problem. This is what they all decided to do. So my beef with the Fed is that all of the things that it did to loosen requirements, to let the banks get bigger, let them get more reckless, leading up to the crisis was the more pernicious um, part of the scenario than the aftermath. Now, they've blown up the balance sheet. What is it, three trillion almost, the Fed balance sheet? You know, I don't know how they're going to take that down. They can't take it down right now. They won't. As far as leaving interest rates too low, absolutely. Huge mistake. Alan Greenspan, drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, just should not have done that. Uh, I'm going to call on a woman. Right there. That's you, yes. I would expect that a real company has answered the broad picture of how we do screen, but you can't have some of the issues in the same thing that you said about the immediate future, about how to limit some of these possibilities. And one of the answers probably is regulation, but regulation is a monumental category, and it's also a very political category. Okay, so that was a um, very interesting question that I now have to put into five words, ten words. What is the, I guess the question is, what do I see as um, a way to make regula regulator the regulatory structure more effective going forward? Would that be a good characterization? Okay. Right. Well, I'll just say one point, and that is that I think we have to take a, an entirely new look at the incentives that are 
given or not given to regulators to do a good job. I mean, my feeling throughout the crisis and the years leading up to it was not that we didn't have enough regulations on the books. We had plenty of regulations on the books about mortgages, about um, uh, high cost loans. We had states that were going up against, you know, federal regulators on predatory loans. There, there were laws on the books that were not enforced. Okay, so that was part of the failure. Um, we have to make somehow, we have to bring the same kinds of incentives that you and I work under to the regulatory regime in Washington. That, you know, it's just crazy that these people get rewarded with bigger jobs after they've failed doing the job that they were supposed to do. I don't know how you do it, but we've got to put in place some way to make sure that if they have failed, they don't move on to some other, you know, very important or even slightly important job in Washington. I mean, it, there is, seems to be this revolving door where people, does, it doesn't matter how badly they perform, they show up, you know, somewhere else at some other agency. Um, so I think this is a big, huge issue, and I don't think it's something you can easily solve with just a commentary. But if we could structure the incentives for regulators and not allow them to, you know, quickly go into the industries that they were regulating or come from them, I think that would help. There is still that revolving door. But they just don't have the right incentives. They have no incentives at the moment, as it, except to go get that big job on Wall Street at the end of the line. Yes? Um, Uh, the question is what, besides not breaking up big institutions, do I see as the major shortcomings of Dodd-Frank? Um, one is that it creates more too big to fail institutions. Uh, and, you know, in addition to not breaking them up, it has uh, enshrined additional new institutions that are too big to fail. What I'm talking about are the um, clearing houses for credit default swaps and derivatives. They now have a explicit backstop. They now have an explicit ability to go to the Fed uh, discount window and to receive, um, it, you know, money in exigent circumstances is what they call it. That's the, you know, when your hair's on fire and you're about to, you know, the world's coming to an end, you give them money. Um, so, A, they created more institutions that are too big to fail. Um, but I think a broader, bigger problem is that Dodd-Frank allowed, uh, left so much of the heavy lifting to the regulators to do, the rule writing, um, and I understand the mentality, I understand the idea behind this is that they're more knowledgeable about what to do and how to do it properly, but it gives the large financial institutions a second bite at the apple to try to finagle, manipulate, massage, whatever word you want to use, the outcome. And so this is two, two times they can try to get their way. And if they didn't get their way the first time, they're going to try again. So the regulators have to be extremely stalwart. And we're just going to have to see how that plays out. I don't, I'm not totally confident. Yes? Uh, you've uh, very openly uh, described the, uh, the role of uh, certain practices in the financial sector that led to this uh, crisis. But you did mention in passing the uh, wage stagnation that occurred uh, in recent times. So uh, the average household had uh, constant or declining uh, income. Uh, I uh, wonder if uh, you, know, you would comment on the possibility that there's really nothing that could be done to change the financial sector that by itself uh, could solve this problem of bad recurrence. After all, uh, since for several decades, labor markets in, in the US and many other countries have worked to prevent workers' wages from really rising very much, you could argue that the kind of activities the financial sector engaged in were about the only way the economy could be gotten to grow. Stock market bubble, housing bubble, 
you know, maybe Alan Greenspan realized, you know, if you stop these bubbles, how is the economy going to grow? Because there wasn't enough demand uh, coming from anywhere else. So perhaps to prevent this from happening again, more needs to be changed than just uh, changes in the financial sector. What do you think of that? Um, did everyone hear that commentary? Uh, the, the comment basically was that it is not um, solely fixing the financial institutions or the financial landscape is certainly not enough. Uh, more work must be done, especially given the fact that wages are stagnant um, and uh, that perhaps during the bubbles of, you know, the internet bubble in 2000 or the late 90s, the housing bubble, that that was the only way to make the economy grow. Well, you know, I, I think I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that there is a risk that um, Alan Greenspan really did perhaps believe that that was. I know, I, I feel like I know that he felt that it was important to throw money at the problem when the internet bubble burst, and that's why he kept interest rates down at 1% uh, for so long. But it's just not a sustainable business model for this country, you know, to operate uh, that way. And so, you know, I would agree wholeheartedly that we have to have a, um, you know, thorough examination of what we can do better in this country, what we can do right, and make it a, an effort that includes everyone and not just a tiny percentage of the population. I mean, the thing that I noticed throughout those years was how much of the, uh, you know, earnings, how much uh, uh, corporate earnings were dominated by the financial system. And we all know why it was, because it was, you know, they were, they were uh, inventing things that had huge margins because people didn't understand them. They were ripping people's lungs out on mortgages. That You know, it was all of these sort of ugly things, but it was extremely profitable. Well, that's no way to run a railroad. And so I agree with you. I think we need to have a, an entirely new way of thinking about how, very inclusive, about how many, many more people can participate in the system than just a small little sliver that then maybe you hope trickles down to the rest. Yes? Why do you think there was such a lack of will on the political over this country? We know the problems. Why is there a lack of will to try to fix the problem? The question is, why is there a lack of political will? I, I assume you're talking about the administration and Congress? And business leaders at all. Why is there just that lack of will? Well, I think that, let's talk about government. You know, business leaders, I don't know. I think that you could maybe argue that they um, like it the way it is. Uh, they got it pretty good. You know, they run to daddy if they have problems and daddy bails them out. Um, so let's talk about the government. Why isn't, why isn't there more political will to stand up to the banks, for instance, to, um, really cut them down to size, create more of a, you know, um, total, holistic, whatever you want to call it, um, economy. Um, at, at first, you know, I thought that, well, first of all, Congress is very involved in the problem. Very, very, very involved in creating the problem. So that is why they are not jumping up and down and telling you about all the good things that they're going to do um, you know, to save the world and to solve this crisis. I think that they don't want you to pay too much attention to what they were doing along the way, like supporting Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac when these entities were blowing up their balance sheets, ballooning their balance sheets, using the taxpayer subsidy to enrich themselves. You know, they had a huge support group in Congress who if anybody looked cross-eyed at Fannie Mae, they would be run out of town on a rail. So I think Congress, you know, understands that it has its own kind of um, guilt complex, if they, if they have a guilt, you know, the ability, the capacity for guilt, I don't know. But, um, you know, as far as the administration is concerned, you know, initially I was disappointed with the selection of 
the financial team that Obama chose because I think that they were part of the creators of the mess. But, you know, I sort of gave him a pass because I thought, well, he doesn't really, it's not his area, it's not his area of expertise. Um, so he relied upon some of the old crew from Clinton's, you know, administration. You know, but now it's kind of too late to just say that it's somebody else's problem. Now he owns it. And I really don't understand why he is not willing to be more, you know, take, take a sort of a stronger um, approach to the problem. Uh, I think he's listening to Tim Geithner, and I think that explains a good deal of it. Um, and so it's going to be, again, this bank-centric mode. Um, I, 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 he made a mistake. He should not have made him Treasury Secretary. He should have taken a break and just gotten somebody new. Maybe Paul Volcker would have been my pick. But he's not new, but I mean, he was not a part of the problem. Um, but he did not do that, so now he sort of got um, tarnished with these people's um, participation in the mess. But I would love to know the answer to it. Some, someday maybe Bob Woodward will write a book and we'll know. Yes? To what degree do you think some of the choices made in the fall of the would have been different if we weren't dealing with a lame duck team? Was there expediency involved? I really, the question is, did, to what degree was, were the decisions made in 2008, in the fall of 2008, um, bad choices because there was a lame duck in the White House? I don't think that it really had that much of a role, but I could be wrong. I'm not a political reporter, and I'm the first one to say that I'm not, and happily so. But, um, you know, I think that Hank Paulson really had the run of the place, and I think that what he wanted to do, he did. So I don't really think it had much to do with Bush. I think that it was his show, he was running it, and he was, you know, going to just basically do what he felt he needed to do. And I think Bush was kind of along for the ride. I think he was equally bewildered, you know, um, by the events. But I don't really think it was, I don't think it was in Hank Paulson's mind, oh, I can't really do this because he's a lame duck. I think he was just, um, you know, doing what he felt he had to do, um, you know, and some of the choices were, you know, in hindsight, not good ones, but, you know, it's easy to be the Monday morning quarterback. I, uh, but I am, again, not uh, steeped in the ways of Washington, so that I could be entirely wrong about that. But the times that I met him, I felt that he was a person who called the shots. Paulson. Yes, on the aisle. Um, and so we may not have an out on this just because you're not a political reporter, but um, given the role that the business has and the role that Congress has, um, do you or any of your colleagues at, at the Times have a, have a good um, way of looking at to see who's actually um, funding the current collection as well as you know, the, the money is, is free speech now uh, and, and you don't have to disclose this figure? That seems to be important. Is, are there any, when you've gone over calendars, are there any, any avenues you can see that seems behind the uh, question? is, um, you know, with the election that's upon us uh, and the um, uh, recent Supreme Court decision allowing um, opening sort of the floodgates to money that's shrouded in secrecy uh, being put into elections, uh, are we seeing anything at the paper that would indicate who's behind? Uh, these ads, or I am really the wrong person to ask about that. But I do know that there are there's a team of reporters who are dedicated to this very issue, um, who are really trying to run this down. And they had a good story. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was Monday's paper on the front page about a person I had never heard of before, but uh, who's another you know one of these sort of behind the scenes guys, and they were drawing the curtain back on him, giving a lot of money to. Um, it was about ethanol. He it was a per, someone who was involved with ethanol, and so it was all about ethanol and promoting ethanol. Um, so I would look for the byline Don Van Natta, V-A-N-N-A-T-T-A. -T -T He's a stellar reporter. I worked with him on the Hank Paulson stories uh, in 2000 and. 
nine, and he's, he would be following this and following it very closely. Yes? Um, I really like your archaeology metaphor at the beginning of your talk, and that um, because hidden in plain sight seems to be one of the themes. If you think back to Enron and special investment vehicles, or Goldman Sachs and their classic CDL, I mean, these were all you know, listed, they were in front of us, but we didn't know if they were you or like you had brought a narrative, brought, brought a narrative to me. Can you talk about your process for bringing their narrative and meaning? Do you, do you talk to academics? Do you read the data yourself? How, how do you how do you do narrative and meaning? Uh, the question is, um, how do uh, these are things that are out there and evident? Um, some of these uh, questionable securities, um, arcane, uh, you know, instruments that were created to obfuscate and um, shear sheep, whatever. Um, how do we go about telling that story? Um, you know, I don't have an assistant. I don't have a staff. Um, People call me up and say, can you have your assistant fax me something? I say, I've been at the paper 12 years. I'm still waiting to meet that person. <laughs> um, so, you know, you do it all yourself, but you do it with a army of people on the street who are willing to help you. They're not all willing to help you, but there are people out there on Wall Street who are equally outraged about these practices. And they will walk you through it and explain it to you in English, you know, and, and they can't write it, and so you have to, you know, synthesize it and then put some clothing on it, make it, you know, something that the person doesn't just get a headache reading. But, you know, I have so many people who are willing to help me. Anonymously, yes, but willing to explain the way the world works, put me on to, you should be talking to this person or that person or the other, you know, and so I couldn't do it without them. So there are people, good people out there, who want these stories to be told. And then the process works this way. Once you feel confident that you understand it, you have the documentation that you need. One of the best things about being a business reporter is that it is mostly based on fact that have been, facts that have been registered with the SEC in financial filings. It is not something that drops into my lap from a source who is eager to get, um, you know, back at someone or, you know, has some ax to grind. These are usually things that you can ferret out if you're given the right direction. So business reporting is far cleaner than political reporting because I don't have to be beholden to the people who give me these things, as you would if you were a political reporter who's waiting for the, you know, um, leak of that, you know, classified document. You have to wonder about why that person's giving it to you. So, you know, then we go about verifying the information, obviously calling the company for their side of the story. What were they thinking when they created this instrument? Um, you know, a lot of times they don't want to talk to me, but, you know, at least I, I give them the right to do so. I give them enough time to do so. Um, I have, in my career, you know, stopped writing a story because I listened to the other side and I felt that I was on the wrong track. So you do try to hear all sides of the story. And then you try to put it into English, and then you run the gauntlet of your editors, and then, God willing, it runs in the paper or online. So that's how it works. In the very back. Yes, about your editors. I read the poem and I always feel I'm better informed for it, so I thank you. Thank you. And I am grateful that you shine the light that you shine. So with regard to your editors, do they interact? question is, do my editors ever tell me to um, try to rein me in or tell me not to go there? No. Um, I'm trying to think if ever in my entire career. Uh, at Forbes, uh, I was at Forbes for 10 years and I had a very explosive story that I was working on and it was really, um, it was one where I had some a not, I had some confidential sources who were telling me that a man who was very powerful 
and a, a big pr profitable unit at Bear Stearns was taking money under the table in exchange for clearing trades for fly-by-night brokerage firms. So Bear Stearns was giving, this, giving these fly-by-night companies its imprimatur. So I was ready to go with the story. The lawyers had signed off on it. All the way up the Forbes masthead had signed off on it. And one of the sort of second tier editors stopped me in the hall and says, you know, you're gonna get sued. And I said, well, I don't really think so. And you know, the lawyers have signed off on it. I'm not really worried about it. He said, well, I have a way to solve that problem for you. I have a way to make sure you won't get sued. And I said, well, what's that? He said, take out the part about how he takes money under the table. <laughs> I said, uh-huh, <laughs> no. I'm not going to gut the story so I don't get sued. So there are people out there who do that kind of preemptive, I'm worried, I'm afraid, I can't go there, I'm not going to run the story, or I'm going to gut the story. There are people out there. I just try not to ever work for them. Yes? Um, the question is, how has my job changed? Is it more challenging and difficult to get answers to questions to plumb these, you know, mystifying things, uh, entities, securities, etc.? Uh, it is more difficult. I'm trying to think why. Um, you know, one of the things that's definitely different is that it's been a steady stream of scandal for the last 12 years. And when I was at Forbes, which was starting in the uh, late 80s, um, I, I actually was able to write about companies doing the right thing. And I can't do, I just, I don't have time to do that anymore. And that's, that's, that's kind of a, kind of a, a sad thing because um, people think I'm just a nattering nabob of negativism. <laughs> But, um, you know, I just sort of feel like there are a lot of people out there who, there, there are not enough people out there willing to kind of shine the light in these areas, so that's sort of my, my deal and that's what I like to do. But, so yes, it's changed. It's kind of been this steady stream of scandal. Um, again, this I think goes to that question about greed and, and maybe that's a part of it, that there is this grasping sense going on that, you know, people are really just going for the, gusto, the gold ring, whatever it is, and so pushing the envelope much more. And so it just is becoming a, a steady stream of scandal. But um, my job is just significantly harder than it was because of the internet, because um, of emails, the mountains of emails that I get. And I welcome those because it's my relationship with my reader and that's important to me. But the internet has also dropped down the barriers that you have with the public and so it's very difficult for me to answer all of those and I find that to be frustrating. Um, it's extremely labor intensive. I don't have a weekend anymore. I'm working all the time. I'm tied to my emails. So it's, it's just 24-7. Now maybe that's because we're in a crisis period, but I sort of think it's probably going to be that way from here on in. Yes. Uh, you have sort of laid a disclaimer about not being a political reporter, but I'm still going to ask you a political question because the wonderful thing about politics is we can all have opinions without any knowledge whatsoever. <laughs> well, that would be me. Yeah. Um, you've talked about all the crises, the credit crisis mortgage crisis, corporate crisis, that has manifested itself into a real political movement called the Tea Party in this country. And it's likely we're going to end up with a whole new slew of political leaders. Do you, your opinion, do you see those political leaders that we may be getting, in fact, we've got one in this state right now, Senator Brown, are they going to make the problem better? all these problems that you've identified, or are they going to make it worse? It's, uh, it's hard to know. I mean, you know, some of the, uh, these, uh, you know, this, this woman in Delaware is just wild. I mean, I, I sort of don't know how she could really help solve the financial crisis, but, you know, maybe she could. I mean, I, you know, stir the pot, right? You know, we're, 
we're a big change, and let's be open to all ideas. So um, I don't have a predisposed idea about what they will bring to the party. Um, you know, it's, it's just very hard to generalize, I think. I think it's disappointing <laughs> that, um, that the Democrats haven't really realized how they can maybe capitalize on this anger. You know, they have, I think that's kind of a mystifying aspect of this Tea Party ascension that I don't understand because that is typically, the, the populist anger is typically what a Democratic Party would be able to tap into. And so the fact that they can't or haven't been able to is kind of, kind of odd to me. But it's hard for me to know what these people are going to contribute. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it does contribute this idea that kick the bums out, you know, which maybe brings a little bit of accountability to the scenario that didn't exist before, so I'm for that. You know, I'm for the idea that maybe some of these people who are very entrenched might actually be a little bit concerned about losing their seats, but it's hard to go beyond that and know, you know, overall what they're going to contribute to the, you know, resolution of these problems. I think we did it. I have a question. <laughs> oh, one more. I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, you talked a lot about the fact that nobody responsible for this, these problems have been successfully prosecuted. In fact, I think they've only tried to prosecute a couple of Bear Stearns guys and they were let off. Um, who, who is responsible for the fact that nobody has been uh, prosecuted? Who should be doing this? Um, are there a lot of prosecutions, do you think, in the pipeline that we're going to start hearing about? Um, so that's my first question. Who's responsible for that, and what's, what do we see coming down the pike? And who should be doing it? And the second... No, nope, no, nope, no, nope. let me answer one okay. first. <laughs> so I'll forget it. Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, why, are there, why have there not been any prosecutions, and why, who should be doing them? And um, so, uh, you know, Initially, I sort of had this feeling that, uh, I mean, the, the amount of money that was lost, the obvious dereliction of duty that went on, the size of the you know, problem, the recession, the length of the recession, all of these things, the unemployment, all of these things point clearly to a very big problem, a very big crisis. Why is no one being held accountable? Um, Initially, I thought that maybe it was because people in positions of power in Washington felt that the economy and, the, in fact, the country was so fragile that we couldn't have prosecutions, high-profile prosecutions, that let's get to the, let's get over the chasm and then we'll start having them. I don't know if that's true. It felt kind of that way to me, which I did not think was um, the right way to do things. but. I don't know if that's the answer, but that's one thing that did strike me during the 2008-2009 period, that maybe people felt, maybe somebody said to somebody at the DOJ, let's just hold off on some of these prosecutions until we really get a little bit more of a, a solid grounding financially. Um, just mere speculation. Who should be bringing these cases? Well, the Department of Justice, first and foremost, should be bringing these cases. Um, they are the ones to bring the criminal cases. The SEC is not, it does not bring criminal cases, they bring civil securities fraud cases. And perhaps the biggest fish that they are going to try to fry goes on trial Tuesday in Los Angeles, and that is Angelo Mozillo, who was the CEO of Countrywide Financial. Um, he is being, uh, he's on trial with two of his colleagues for insider trading. Um, they contend, the SEC contends, that he knew that the company was going down the tubes and was selling hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stock without disclosing to the public that it was at peril. Um, he is probably the biggest name person that has yet to face a trial. It's a jury trial. It's a civil trial, so this will not be a criminal case. But um, I have, I'm writing a story about this as what we call a curtain raiser for Sunday's paper, and um, some of my legal sources tell me that if the SEC is successful in this case and they get um, the jury to find them, find Angelo Mozilla liable, 
then it is possible that the U.S. attorney would come in and try to bring a criminal case. But in a civil case, your bar is lower. You only have to find a preponderance of evidence, whereas criminal um, is a far higher bar. So it's not clear to me that he will be indicted, but there is that possibility. Um, who knows, the SEC may not even mount a successful case, but it is going to be something that people are watching because it's one of the biggest name people out there. Um, I think state regulators could bring cases, and they've been trying to bring cases, but <clears throat> maybe there's just too much an embarrassment of riches that they can't um, you know, uh, mount these cases. But uh, it really starts at the DOJ and then works down SEC uh, state AGs. You're seeing state AGs start to get involved in the foreclosure problems now. I think that they see a, a real good opportunity and uh, the feds seem to be sort of standing behind not doing anything about that. So um, those are some of the units or groups that should be really very active. And all along, the DOJ had a mortgage fraud unit that was supposed to be really looking at mortgage fraud. And they just have not brought many cases at all. The SEC's case against Goldman Sachs was sort of a, sort of a highlight. Um, and that was, you know, uh, something that I think people were surprised by because Goldman is so very powerful and politically connected. Um, so that would be, I think, the highest profile case. Again, a civil case, not a criminal case. Um, but yeah, the cases have been few and far between. Well, question number two. My second question. Uh, but before we let you go, uh, the economics department would like to present you a couple of tokens of our great esteem. Wow. First is this plaque, ah. University of Massachusetts, Philip Gamble Award. Wow. Beautiful. And the second is a framed copy of uh, the poster. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and don't worry, we will mail these to you so you don't have to carry them back. <laughs> and um, I want to thank the photographer, Nicole Dunn, for all the work <laughs> that she did in putting this together. Yes. And thank you, Gretchen, for a wonderful talk. What about and the second question? Do I get to ask? Yes, no, well, yeah, we'll ask, yeah. I'll ask you at dinner. Oh, okay. And, um, no, no, these people want to know. What was it? Really? <laughs> Encore. Well, it'll be kind of anticlimactic after all. Oh. <laughs> it's your call. It's your call. Okay, here's the second question. Um, we talked a bit about the, uh, the uh, foreclosure crisis, the fact that banks now are trying to foreclose on homes that they probably don't really own legally. And um, I wanted to ask you what you think the Obama administration should do about this. In particular, uh, should they support a moratorium on, a nationwide moratorium on foreclosures? And if, uh, if not, what should, should they do to deal with this uh, problem that we might have a grand, another grand theft uh, happening on uh, uh, to people who uh, don't, probably don't deserve it? Um, uh, th this is a really uh, nettlesome problem because it is, um, it happens, these foreclosures are one by one by one by one. It's not an easily solved problem. State laws are different from state to state. Um, I think that what I hope will happen is that the Obama administration will use this opportunity to sort of use this as a club to, or a stick to, you know, get some leverage with the banks to do the right thing on what, whether it's real, genuine mortgage modifications that work, not these phony tack on the arrears and interest on the back end. I mean, a real principal write down, loan mod, which is the only thing that works. Um, particularly when you have so many people upside down on their mortgages. Um, you know, you'll have people screaming about moral hazard, that this is another message sent to people that they can be reckless and irresponsible. But, you know, my feeling is that, well, we've already sent that message to the big banks, so why should the individuals be the ones that we now say, nope, sorry, moral hazard is too big a problem here. I don't like moral hazard any more than the next person, but, it, it, if you start to make the little guy pay and, the, and, and continue to let the institutions off the hook, 
it again, I think, widens the divide in this country between not only the rich and poor, the haves and have nots, but also institutions and the individual. And I think that's very dangerous. Um, so I think what they should do is use it. Obviously, these were bad practices. Um, they flouted the law. They should not be allowed to just dispense with the appropriate paperwork. The rule of law still should exist in this country when little individual people are concerned. So I would like the Obama administration to use this as a leverage tool to get some real action out of the banks, whereas the mortgages are concerned. That was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. We have a reception.